Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, welcome to the City Futures Summit. My name is uh, Kes McCormick and I am an Associate Professor at Lund University here in Sweden at the International Institute for Industrial Environmental Economics. Yes, that's an organisation with a long and confusing name, but in short, we work with sustainable solutions. And in particular, we have a large focus on cities and urban development and how we can create sustainable cities. Most importantly, I'll be one of your moderators today for this online summit, connecting people, places and projects from all around the world. Now, typically we would hold a physical event um, at our Institute and perhaps fit about 200 people into our largest room here in Sweden. But today we welcome hundreds, if not thousands of people from around the world to an online event. And to be perfectly honest, it's absolutely fantastic. So at this summit, we want to explore missions for sustainable urban transformation from the perspectives of academia, uh, government, business, society, and you out there around the world. We want to provide a critical and creative forum to take forward's bold and inspirational missions. But what is the mission's approach? Well, that's exactly what this event is all about and what we're going to explore today. Now, we will be recording this webinar uh, for those that cannot attend live and put the film on the summit website and on YouTube and perhaps even use it in our massive open online courses. Um, we will also produce a podcast of the summit, so you'll be able to listen again later and even present an agenda, a call for action as a key outcome of the summit, which will be sent to everyone afterwards. Today, we will have three speakers beaming in from Australia, Chile and Northern Sweden, and we will interview those speakers about missions, sustainability, innovation and cities. We will even have in the middle of this webinar, a Swedish Fika break. That's about 10, 15 minutes to go grab a coffee, stretch your legs and reflect for a moment. It's a very Swedish thing to do. After the break, we will have two panelists who will reflect on the interviews and the speakers and contribute to a lively discussion about what's really important to take forwards. And those two panelists are the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Lund University here in Sweden, which is the largest university in Scandinavia, and the National Architect of Sweden. Yes, you heard right, that's quite an impressive job title. But finally today, we'll also have some other people moderating and co-hosting this event, two other colleagues of mine from the Institute, and they have very important jobs at this summit. So I'm gonna hand over to Jessica now to briefly present what she'll be doing at this summit. Over to you, Jessica. All right, thanks, Kez. Yes, as Kez mentioned, my name is Jessica Luth Richter and I work at the IIIW as well. Today, I will be looking for any questions that the audience has. We do have a Q&A, and if you look at the bottom of your screen, if you're using it on a laptop, you'll see a Q&A button within that. If you open the, the panel, you'll be able to type questions, and I'll be looking for questions that we can then ask the different speakers and the panelists. Okay, so we're looking forward to an interactive session today. All right, back to you, Kez. Thanks a lot, Jessica. Um, yep, this is your chance, send in questions and be part of the conversation. My other colleague today is Bjorn um, at the Institute. He's also known for his abilities with Menti. You may have heard of Menti before, but he's known as the Menti master. So we're gonna jump over to Bjorn now. He's gonna introduce how we're gonna use Menti today and ask you a few questions. Over to you, Bjorn. Thank you, Kes. Um, so we're here uh, with a Mentimeter questions for all of you to, to spur some interactivity apart from the Q&A that you just heard about from Jessica. Um, and um, for those of you have, who have prepared, you have downloaded the app uh, for using Mentimeter and that's the first option uh, that I recommend. Um, but why don't we just get started? Uh, so I want all of you to, to either open your app and log in with a code that you soon will be seeing here. And um, if you don't have the app, of course, you can also just use a normal browser and uh, get uh, type in menti.com. And then you all will be using uh, the following code that you can see on your upper right corner. 76830089. And once you're in the system, you start contributing with your 
uh, uh, answers and ideas. So the first question we are looking at is, of course, uh, interested in where you are at the moment. So in what city are you living? And we can see that the screen is already popping. A lot of guys are watching from Lund. That's where we are, but we have a multitude of, um, of cities here, Munich, Mannheim. Oh, we have a city called Climate. That's an interesting one. Gdansk, Ljubljana, uh, Göteborg, Melbourne, Antwerp, Lebanon, Trondheim. Oh, a beautiful, and as you go, um, this word cloud is getting richer and richer. And um, we have over 100 people now contributing, and I urge all of you to, to go into menti.com and use the code you can see on your upper right corner. There will be more questions coming. But look how beautiful it is. And, and this word cloud here represents the richness in our global audience today. And um, I think, well, I just wait a one more second here before we were finished. There's still people contributing. That's beautiful. Um, and the, the bigger the name is, the more people are sitting there at the moment. Uh, I'd like to continue because this richness that you all represent is also captured in the beautiful um, map that we have been creating running up to this event. And uh, I'll be jumping here uh, and let's just have a last look at this beautiful word cloud. Um, the next picture I'll be showing is also showing this world map uh, where you guys have pinned your locations. Uh, and um, oh, there's a lot of thumbs up and you're already being so interactive. I love it. Now, uh, there's also uh, some stories that you have sent in or our testimonials of what is going on in your cities. And uh, I found uh, this story and photo very um, thoughtful. Um, so this is a, a Maid uh, in Amman, Jordan, who um, sent in a photo, but also talked about uh, typical problems that we all face uh, with traffic congestion, uh, dependence on car vehicles, and no space uh, given to, to walking and biking. Um, but uh, as we can see from the photo, um, citizens are using here the space of an unfinished BRT, a bus rapid transit for walking and cycling. And uh, there's so many, many things to think about when I see this photo, uh, but one being of course that the importance of, of planners and decision makers to, to listen to their citizens and and also giving, giving them the space uh, that they need uh, and also listen to what citizens really, citizens really want and need. Um, so uh, thanks for this, Maid. Uh, and now over to uh, the next question around the main expectations that you have for today. Uh, and this is a question where you can uh, uh, answer on a scale from like neutral, if you're not so interested in, in, in the topic or uh, over to super interested. So now you, you, you kind of drag uh, and put the, the finger on the different questions uh, where you feel that you stand. So you have the alternatives, I am looking to learn and understand. Uh, the second one is I want to discuss this topic in the collab, which is coming after the webinar. I want to network and meet new people, and I'm looking to get new ideas and inspiration. And people are indeed contributing. Thank you so much for that. Um, and it seems like uh, I'm looking to get new ideas and inspiration is, is your favorite pick. Um, yes, well, so that we have a winner, it looks like, and that's, uh, the, the topic of getting new ideas and inspiration and, and, and learning and understanding. And we hope that uh, you will be able to do all of this today. Now for the last question, I am curious about 
and this is my favorite uh, word cloud, Mentimeter word cloud that I usually do with uh, students and, and in other courses that we run here at the Institute. So in your view, what characterizes sustainable urban transformation? And here I want you to list one to three keywords. Uh, I think you have three entries. Uh, and as we go, we will create another uh, beautiful word cloud here. So anything that that pops into your mind, what do you think is important for sustainable urban transformations? And if we take a look at the, the cloud, we can see green in the middle there. Uh, beautiful. And inclusive, rapid, biking, equality. I think what I want to, to think about around this word cloud is the complexity. And uh, let's uh, bear in mind for the, rem the remainder of this webinar that, that solving uh, urban challenges are really complex, but let's not reduce it to, to um, singular topics or to, uh, to silos. We need to, to in embrace these, this complexity demonstrated in this beautiful word cloud. Now, I want to say thank you for contributing. I will get back later uh, with more questions for you. Uh, but now it's time to get it back to Kess. Thanks a lot, Björn. I mean, I think um, we use Menti in, in various forms of education, both online education and, and physical education. And, and I think like here, what this what you see is first and foremost, like Björn was saying, is like an amazing global audience um, when, when you start to, to run these kind of things and these maps that we have. Um, but as Björn kind of centered in on, we, there's also these stories everywhere. Um, and you've got to, got to dig down to that level of, of the city level, the ground level to, to extract those stories and understand those stories. And then that final question there from Bjorn, I mean, it is absolutely correct that it's incredibly complex when we talk about sustainable urban transformation. And we, we can't be afraid of that complexity. We have to kind of grab hold of it and explore it, but we need to find ways to navigate through this complexity, um, how we form policies, how we form collaborations, uh, how we make business strategies and so on. And these are many of the questions we're going to deal with today. Um, so it's time to get started with our three speakers who we're going to interview today. Um, as Jessica said, please send in your questions as you hear us talk and she'll pull out the best and brightest and pose them to some of our speakers. Um, and we hope that the speakers today can provide kind of three different perspectives on some of these key questions around missions, sustainability, innovation systems, and can help to provide some inspiration and, and some kind of key learning insights for people around the world. So let's get started. Our first speaker today is joining us from Melbourne, Australia, which happens to be where I was born and grew up. Um, so we'll be kicking off this uh, webinar with two Australians. We seem to be, have been doing this a few times, Kathy and me. So our first speaker is Kathy Oak. She is a senior advisor for the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy, as well as the first vice president for Equally Local Government Sustainability. Welcome to the summit, Kathy. Thanks, Kess. Just want to hear your voice before, before I start talking. <laughs> Good to see you again. Very good to see you as well. Look, I think my first question just to kick off is about the, these organisations. I mean, the Global Covenant of Mayors and ICLE, mm -hmm. I mean, just briefly, what are these organisations and why are they important to sustainable urban development? Oh, goodness, you've only got a short period of time, right, Kess? But, That's well, correct. GCO yeah, so the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy, um, it's a coalition of over 10,000 cities that have committed to climate action essentially and it's really quite exciting that you know these 10,000 cities represent um, I think it's 941 million people and if you aggregate all of the effort that these cities have committed to with respect to climate action you're looking at about 24 billion tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions reduction by 2030 so um, you know so that's important when you think about these city networks because it aggregates the power of cities. But the other important thing about these city networks and, and, and looking to organizations like ICLEI that I've been involved with for the last 12 years um, 
you know, it's about city sharing and city learning and, and inspiration from others, but also, you know, you know, learning um, across jurisdictions as well, which I think you've, you know, in your introduction, that what we're talking about today is so important. Yeah. So, and with the Global Covenant of Mayors, the role that I play um, is with this, one of their key initiatives called Innovate for Cities. And that's really all about city-led city research and, and city innovation, but working with our partners in research and um, academia and industry and business and all levels of government. And, and Innovate for Cities is really about understanding what are the knowledge needs of cities to, to meet their climate ambition. And you know, to me, that's really exciting. And, and this conversation today is all about really scaling up that ambition and, and making it a, a reality. Am I allowed to do a plug, Kess? Only because I'm really, <laughs> no, I'm just really conscious that right now, Eakley has got their very big event running in parallel to your event, Daring Cities is on. And if I merge both of my hats um, next week on the 15th of October, uh, we are running a 24 hours of Innovate innovate the cities in all time zones for all cities that's my plug thank you you are most definitely allowed to do a plug i mean i think like <laughs> these organizations show that i mean that cities are able to, to learn from each other and communicate in in unbelievable ways now through these kind of global alliances and as you mm. also pointed out there is now an extraordinary number of online events taking place like daring cities and so on which are really allowing people all over the world to, to, to join such events and to be part of these conversations yeah. and these dialogues, which is so fantastic. Um, yeah. Today, I mean, we want to kind of focus in on this, this term missions or the missions approach. And I suppose I just want to ask you first off, I mean, what pops into your mind or what do you think about or how do you react to this, this term or concept of missions? Yeah, it's, it's interesting putting aside what is a, a, a mission led approach for cities mean like when I think about a mission, <laughs> you know, you think about these huge efforts that bring together people from diverse backgrounds, you know, with a common goal or a common objective. Um, and, and often it's something that might be might seem unattainable, but it is actually feasible and working together, you know, these things are possible. And, you know, you know, in your promotional material, and we've seen it used a lot, you know, the moonshot reference is, is actually really apt because it's like, we've got, to, we've got to really reach for the moon if we want to transform the cities in the way that we, we know we need to. And so I really think that, you know, that mission led approach is a really, it's, you know, it is exactly what we're needing to do to bring together a whole lot of people that have got a, a, a common goal, but might be looking at it from a different perspective or multiple different perspectives, um, because it's really the only way that we're going to do it. So, yeah, when I think of a mission, you might think of something like an Olympics bid or, a you know, a, a city <laughs> going for the, you know, a soccer grand final or something. But this is all about, you know, something maybe more important than that, which is, you know, climate neutral cities and, and, and livable cities. No, absolutely. I mean, I mean, the missions approach has, has been made, of course, incredibly famous by, by the mission to the moon, which is perhaps the most one of the most extraordinary missions by humanity to, to send some human beings to the moon and back, um, which was an incredible technological mission. And now this mission for, for climate neutral cities is, is another type of mission of, of, you know, equal or greater importance. And, and the challenge is how do we use a missions approach with such a complex topic like climate action? But if we just turn it a little bit and think about like in your opinion and in your experience, what kind of key elements do you think we need to see in the design of missions for sustainable urban transformation? I mean, what, what's really important to include in such missions? Did you just say one element? I did say <laughs> did one say element. One, you said one element, one key element. Um, you can have two if well, you want. I might have a few, but I'll try, you know, you know, this mission, so a mission led approach to cities, it must, you know, if we're thinking big, it must in, ensure that there's innovation at scale that's, and that's innovation from a technological and also a social perspective. You know, we're talking about infrastructure and policy and governance, you know, all the forms of innovation, but it needs to, you know, really find a home in our cities and our communities. And I saw on Bjorn's, you know, Menti, you know, citizen centre, citizen focus, people were very much the words that people were, were talking about. And, and absolutely, when I think of a mission led approach to cities, you're, you're thinking about our communities. And we're and, you know, so, yeah, I mean, you asked for one element, an element is scalability and replicability. But it, because all cities, you know, are ultimately different because of their different contexts. Um, you know, the, a key element is a is an approach that is 
replicable for all types of cities, um, you know, acknowledging that that cities are so different and, and complex. So, yeah, that's, that's, there's quite a few things in there. I know you don't want me to keep going, but, you know, there's, there's a lot in there, but replicability and scalability um, mm. are really key. No, but I mean, I think that this this point of being able to scale uh, successful solutions is, of course, incredibly important. And the possibility to, to replicate successful solutions is also, I think, a key thing with cities, as you're kind of pointing to, is that when we try to replicate, we need to be very, very aware of the different cultural and geographical and political and uh, economic context that we're dealing with so that we don't try to replicate things that won't be replicated very well. And then that's a, a key story when we talk about cities around the world. Um, but if we just continue, if we go back to these, these global alliances, like the Global Covenant of Mayors and ICLEI, I mean, are these organisations or how are these organisations using emissions approach to drive change in cities? I mean, how, how do they kind of work with such an idea or concept? Well, I mean, I mean, one of the strengths of city networks is that they are already working in partnership in so many different ways. They're not only working across, you know, thousands of different cities and, and understanding um, what cities are looking for um, from each other, but from other partners. Um, but then, um, you know, these city networks also have great partnerships in other levels of government, but also in, in the private sector and industry and in, um, in academia. So I think this, you know, the strength of city networks like the Global Covenant of Mayors and ICLEI and UCLG and C40 and, you know, um, you know Eurocities, um, there's, you know, the, the strength is in the partnerships um, and, um, and then the understanding of the capacity and the capability that cities are looking for to, to meet the trans, you know, the trends, the transition that they're looking for. So yeah, certainly a strength in numbers um, because, you know, you could look at one city and think, what could they do alone? But then you join them together and you can really understand the power and really, you know, get a lot of inspiration from that. Yeah, I think I think this is an important point because I think missions we typically associate with one gigantic singular effort, perhaps. Whereas in, yeah. in, in many ways, if we break down a mission, even the mission to the moon is in fact a huge number of successful uh, initiatives and so on that have kind of worked together in a way. And I suppose when we talk about yeah. cities, we're talking about exactly the same thing. That's not about one city trying to solve all the problems everywhere, but if we have you know tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of cities all working with these at the same time, then of course you have a combined global impact of, of some real significance. That's right. And, um, you know, it's really important to work with other, other levels of government and, and GCOM since um, 2019 has been a partner with Mission Innovation. And they've got 25 member governments, including the European Commission. And, and you know, we've got an equal uh, and, uh, you know, a, a common interest in this with the supply of clean energy and clean energy technology and the innovation that's needed to not only to deploy it, but also to you know to engage communities and citizens in, in, in what is needed. And I think that that's a really important partnership. Um, you know, we're, we're, I feel like we've got the city networks and the city, uh, you know, the city to city um, networks going. It's, you know, a real game changer is how do we work with national governments? And, mm -hmm. and again, across the world, it's going to be in a different context. So if you can find organisations like Mission Innovation, um, then you, you know, you're finding different ways to work. And that goes to that point that I was talking about replicability um, mm. and scalability, because context is going to be different everywhere, but you've still got that common goal of, net, you know, net zero. No, I think, I mean, this point of, of multi-level governance and cities working with other levels will also come through today, absolutely. If I can hit you with one kind of like a final question from me, a very practical question, which is to think or to, can you name a city, let's say in your country, <laughs> we'll focus in on Australia, that inspires you and if you can give a, a reason why. And before you answer that question, I should say to the audience, you have been a councillor at the City of Melbourne for 12 years, but we will allow you to choose Melbourne if you like to, or you can choose somewhere else. Well, I have to say I was going to choose Melbourne. No, no, I, <laughs> as soon as you said a favourite city, and it's not just, be, no, I mean, certainly I'm biased, um, but I guess I use Melbourne as an example when we're talking about inspiration of, you know, system system change that's needed and involving lots of different partners. And one project that I'm incredibly proud of at the City of Melbourne is this project called the Melbourne Renewable Energy Project. And, you know, for, for, the, for the, a city of Melbourne to go 100% renewable, 
um, you know, it's a big task, um, especially when the energy supply to our city is quite, you know, dirty, you know, and it is one of the biggest components of our emissions profile. So, you know, we needed large scale renewable energy. Um, and anyway, in the Melbourne Renewable Energy Project, you can look into it, but essentially the, we, we brought together 14 different partners. We collectively signed a, a, common, a 10 year contract to build 17 new wind turbines in regional Victoria. So it also created, you know, huge numbers of jobs within our, our state um, and 88 gigawatt hours of renewable energy. So it really, you know, it was a significant game changer because it showed that, that you know, one city can actually do something quite large with respect to power purchasing agreements. So I, yeah, that, I know I chose my own city, but I those sort of transformative projects are really important to, to showcase what we're talking about when we're looking at a mission led, led approach. Oh, it's a it's a great example. I'm going to hand it over to, to Jessica now, who's got questions flying in from around the world. Uh -oh. And Jessica's <laughs> going to ask you a few questions from our global audience. Over to you, Jessica. Yes. Okay, thanks, Kaz. All right, Kathy. So we you've talked a bit about scalability and replicability, um, the ability to replicate it in other contexts. And we have a question also about specifically this and in the context of Italy or sorry India with Rahul asking about when we're when we're transferring uh, missions approach in India how do you deal with maybe some of the trade-offs in the financing in particular when you need to finance the mission um, and it's seen as a trade-off with other priorities such as poverty reduction employment um, that might be prioritized over climate change missions um, have you have you dealt with this complex question. I feel like we're going to deal with a lot of that in this session today. Um, you know, there's, there's, there are trade-offs in all cities, you know, in the decisions that we're making and, and no more so than, um, you know, in current times with COVID, you know, where we've got all of these cities that are committed to, a, to, to, to um, climate action and yet we're being put under even more stress because of, you know, the, the decisions we need to make about health and well-being of our population. So I know I'm not answering it specifically around India, but certainly, you know, when it comes to trade-offs, uh, I mean, I guess I'd say that there's safety in numbers, right? And that there are, you know, there are looking to, to how other cities are, are making these decisions. Um, but, I, and, and, and some of the inspiration I see is how cities are looking to their citizens to how to, to help them help city governments make their decisions. So participatory approaches to decision-making or going into community to understand how they think cities should respond, I think is you know, certainly a, an approach to help, help make these complex um, you know, decisions um, in our cities where there are trade-offs to be made. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, we actually have a few, a couple other questions along that line. So you're talking about involving stakeholders in a participatory approach. Um, are there any actors when you've worked in missions that you miss or maybe want more involved who aren't as involved in the missions? Um, so we have a question about what actors are, are missing from this mission approach. I mean, I guess that the, the, the mission led approach is relatively new, right? So it's, I mean, it's, 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 um, We've all been trying for many years to um, scale up at at rapid pace, um, and and this is a different way of thinking about bringing everyone together. And I think one of the one of the aspects of this mission led approach is being quite inspirational and in in the transformation that we're trying to do, in bringing people together. Um, uh, but you know, the the actors that are really critical to this us is citizens. And what I'm really liking about what I'm seeing how different jurisdictions are talking about mission-led approach to cities is really putting citizens at the focus, even though clearly we're dependent on policymakers and, and leaders at all levels of government and in industry and the private sector to make good decisions and to, and to, to lead um, when it comes to policy. What I'm really inspired by is that city, the citizen-centered approach that I'm seeing. And, and that is crucial to these things to being a, a success because you need engagement, you need buy-in. If you want to introduce a particular technology or a, a different way to finance um, um, in the city, you need the citizens to have the buy-in and engagement and, and otherwise it's not gonna work. And, um, you know, that, and, and that is 
you know, part of that scalability or that the, the transformation is taking some of the really excellent examples around the world of community led um, renewable energy projects or community led climate financing or community led budgeting that puts climate action at the center, you know, using some of those somewhat, you know, maybe, um, you know, city specific examples and scaling them up. But yeah, absolutely. Citizen, citizens at the center, I think are really key. And that's why cities are so important because as we always say, we're the level of government that are closest to the citizens, right? We are the ones that are in the streets and, 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 um, and know our communities so well. Um, you know, citizens have to be at the center of these missions approach because we, um, you know, we're, we're certainly answerable. I mean, all politicians should be, but um, we're certainly really attuned to what our, what, what our citizens are asking for. Okay, thanks, Kathy. We have lots more questions, actually, but um, a few of them just are coming in now. What I'm going to say to those of you asking questions now is that we will also have time at the end where Kathy will be hopefully back with us uh, after our, our panel speakers, um, where we have a more, a more fluid discussion and we can take some of those at that time. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Jessica, and also thanks to Kathy. God, time flies when you're having fun. Um, we will come back to you, Kathy, later on, but thank you so much for inputs now. Now we're going to jump to our next speaker today, um, who is Philip Neslund, who's a Strategic Development Officer at the city of Umeå up in northern Sweden. He's also a participant in the OECD Roundtable on the Circular Economy in Cities and Regions. Now, for all those people out there, you may never have heard of Umeå, and you may be wondering where is Umeå and why do we have a speaker from this city? And I'll give you a few reasons. One, um, Umeå is a fantastically innovative city involved in many uh, initiatives and activities which are really kind of pushing the, pushing the, the, the envelope on, on a number of topics around sustainable urban development. And another one is that often when we have such summits and so on, we bring in the big international cities. We bring in Paris or London or New York or Melbourne, as we just heard of. But in fact, most people around the world live in small and medium-sized cities. And it's in fact these cities we should be spending a lot of time working with and putting a lot of focus in. So that's a pretty good introduction for you, Philip. Welcome to the summit. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, Jess. And uh, nice to be here. And uh, nice that all of you listening has taken the time. So and to this nice introduction by Kess. And so, uh, before we kickstart this, I, I must say that we are uh, maybe a bit extra proud today from Umeå, since yesterday we found out that uh, Dr. Emmanuel Chaponier was awarded a Nobel Prize for Chemistry, uh, and she was working at the Umeå University by the time when she found out these discoveries on on the gene editation. So we are kind of extra proud. I just uh, also highlighting a bit of the Kathy did and, and say that uh, we are glad to be here and representing Umeå. Okay, so Umeå is now famous for many things. Um, let me jump to my first question about kind of your work and so on. I mean, you work with the, I just mentioned the OECD on kind of circular and collaborative cities. I mean, can you tell us a little bit about what you do with this initiative? Uh, yes, for sure. Uh, I was, uh, when I was listening to Kathy here and uh, emphasizing those uh, international and national collaboration that is so important for cities. And I think uh, many of other cities listening is, can emphasize that we need this kind of input and output from the initiatives and innovation strategies that we are performing. And um, and we are also part of ICLA for mentioning some and also this OC roundtable. And, uh, and this was an initiative launched a few years ago that we we are pushing the agenda for uh, circular economy as a way of being on our mission of climate neutrality by 2030 uh, and also by and for the citizens and this is the approach that we have been uh, given from the from the leading uh, politicians here but also joining the national collaboration in in sweden called viable cities on this uh, task and this is also connect to European level. Um, and uh, I think that is for us the most important to, to be a part of um, networks and initiative that is uh, among the top where we get evaluation from the initiative we are performing and also this kind of interaction. So 
So with OCD, there's a study on circular economy in citizen regions and how it's infect and effects and can support the transition. So I think that is worth looking into. And from that, we also joined the Ellen McCart Foundation recently this year. So this is really important uh, work and networks on the, I mean, the multi-governance side of it, that we need this international and also national connections. Um, no. Yeah. No, as, as I said, there's a lot of activity happening in, in Umeå around sustainable urban development and so on. But when you hear this term missions, I mean, what pops into your mind and, and how do you relate or react to this term or concept or approach? Um, I think uh, for us and uh, also for me, uh, the first thing is that um, uh, maybe it's a more on this uh, in the European and, and Scandinavian, but I think it maybe reflects all around the world that we have a lot of technical solutions that cannot really be um, implemented to reduce uh, these uh, climate emissions. Or, uh, but uh, this mission is on the, on the behavior scale and the social uh, side of it, social uh, sustainability. It has to be included into the environmental and economic goals for, for the cities. And that is what pops into my mind that uh, it's not more about the technical side, it's the, the other uh, parameters that has to be included. And there, the citizens, of course, is uh, at the key center. So this co-creation that we heard about earlier is uh, indeed something that we we really are facing and uh, and needing. And and then also that we are joining each other. So we have a global uh, mission on the SDGs and the Paris Agreement that we have signed up to, and then it's following down from the European level to Sweden and down to the region and local scale. And I think the missions has to be connected in that uh, way. And also to see, as we were talking earlier here, the different um, um, uh, the differences between cities and what we are needing to implement. But I think it's a lot about like just taking the best from all around the world and adjust it to the city um, scale and then try to bring in the citizens, of course, as a part of the uh, co-creation process of solutions. So, so would you? So, I, I think you're already answering my next question. The one about the kind of the key element, in your opinion, how you in the design of missions for sustainable urban transformation, is it exactly what you've just said, or is there other elements that that you need to kind of raise up here when we talk about missions for sustainable urban transformation? Yeah, for me, um, I was listening last week to an uh, to an interesting speak by Mr. Mohamed. Radioni from the mayor of Leuven, that is the innovation capital of Europe this year. And uh, he said, dare to dream. And I think that is correct. And also dare to try. We need this kind of strong test bed activities. And uh, here in Sweden, we have launched several of those. And I think uh, this is something that really is uh, to be emphasized. We need to put in those kind of methods and mandate and, and test beds for the citizens and all the local actors and also bring in uh, other stakeholders to the city to test and try their ideas. And um, this is something for me that can al also create a key element for creating this mission. But uh, in that sense, we also need this kind of direction. So uh, as we have put out those kind of agreements on the global and uh, international scale, also have to have them on the national and local level is so important. And then you can also connect to that uh, with different stakeholders and the citizens. Uh, and um, for me, it's a lot about giving up a bit of control and, and letting the uh, this, uh, civic society take uh, a broader uh, scale of it. Just to be a bit uh, for, like an example, uh, two years ago now, we did the first one, or one of the first um, uh, CO2 emission calculation from the consumption from each citizens in Umeå. And we divided the results up to different city districts and then provided it back to the society or, or to the citizens. So it's an open data platform. You can all see it, you can visit it and create solutions based on those, uh, uh, the data we collected. And I think that is something we really need to do. We have to provide open data platforms so the co-creation can be uh, really scaled from the citizens and also by others. So it's not just someone living in Umeå right now that can visit those uh, data points. All around the world can do it and 
find solutions that can support our city mission. I think that is some key element uh, for me anyway. Yeah, Philip, I think you, you, you've, you've definitely answered also, also this other question about, about, no, but this is fantastic, about a key example from, from a city that inspires you, which is Umeå, you are from Umeå. And I mean, I think that that is an excellent example. And I think just going back to just what you said about uh, committing to, to test beds and experimentation and so on, this is something we do really see strongly in Sweden, the kind of a commitment and investments into basically trying things out and, and seeing what works and trying to explore what kinds of collaborations and policies and technologies uh, can help cities come become more sustainable. And as you mentioned, Viable Cities, which is a, a national program for smart and sustainable cities in Sweden is a, an incredible investment in kind of multi-level governance in Sweden, right from the national government down to the regions, down to the, the local level where, where you are. So it, um, there, there are many things here you can kind of learn from, from these types of investments and initiatives. Um, I'm actually gonna turn it over to Jessica now because I think there's gonna be definitely some questions flowing in from around the world. So over to you, Jessica, ask Philip some questions. Okay, yes, we definitely do have some questions. Um, one of them, again, when we're getting into transferability and Philip, you talked about taking some of the best ideas from around the world and putting them into practice. One question is, is there an advantage to working with, you described Umeå as a, a small to medium-sized city. Does that give you any advantages when working with missions from your point of view? Um, in some sense, yes, uh, since we're really I mean, close to the stakeholders involved, uh, so we can uh, kind of uh, connect to the from the city hall uh, down to uh, city-owned um, companies or other private sector. Also, we have a lot of connection to the civic society um, since we have invested a lot in culture and um, and the association scene here and uh, investing one of the most uh, and largest budgets for that in Sweden uh, per capita. We are kind of uh, really connected to the city in maybe an easier way than if you have um, a larger city. So I think uh, if you are representing a large city, you probably would say that you are focused on different districts that have a stronger district leadership. <laughs> and here we have the whole city is kind of connected from the city hall and, and the department. So in that sense, yes, I think there's an advantage. And we also can uh, really test in the city or in the surrounding environment here in the region in an easy way so, to provide those kind of uh, facilities for testing. I hope that answers it. Yeah. 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 I think um, one other question there was about like what sort of test beds do you and can you give an example of what testing you're doing with citizens or how you're involving them? Because um, it might be an abstract idea, I guess, for some of the audience. Yeah. Yeah. For me, of course, uh, I'm also involved with uh, Cass McCormick in a project called the Sharing City Sweden, uh, where we're testing the sharing economy in cities and how it's affected. And I think. Uh, the great benefits of it is that we can implement the uh, infrastructure in the city as building uh, new uh, sharing hubs, for example, right in the city where you can find uh, shared mobility or shared equipment, etc. That is a change in the physical space where people move. And then you evaluate with the citizens and they develop services with uh, actors in the actual environment uh, where people live everyday lives. And that's really is an effect on uh, that, that gives the, uh, the one living in Ume right now a, a picture of how can this um, transformation be if we would succeed? What is the options from having maybe a private owned car? Yeah, you can share mobility. Okay, how will that work in my life? And I can try it. So I think to, to actually implement those solutions in the city is really what we are all about. So that is maybe the concrete example that we are putting out this kind of uh, shared uh, yeah, you share the um, resources in the city and providing it to the citizens. So I hope that will give one picture of how it could be. And of course, then you can have test beds with more industrial sites. We have a lot of uh, forest industry here, for example. So our, they have their own test beds, but that might be more industrial symbiosis uh, kind of things. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. We also have a question about um, with the COVID-19 pandemic and how you think um, that sustainable urban transformation can play a role in building back better in the crisis or after the crisis. Yeah, yeah I think uh, it will, of course, affect us uh, in many ways. Um, 
for example, I think like in the case of Umeå and maybe in other cities that the, the mobility sector is uh, one of the largest uh, CO2 emissions uh, um, provider from the, from the city and um, with this pandemic when we're working more from home and we are changing the way we, are, we shop for example we have more deliveries to our homes and that is kind of shifting our behavior in when do we actually need to travel in some distances when what for what is the purpose so we can maybe be more critical about our self behavior and and see that this is making it easier and, and a more livable city that we can bring, bring back the streets, for example, for more activities that we saw an example from Bjorn, instead of having just the mobility of, of cars or buses. So uh, I can see that we will really, I think, strengthen that. And also um, the production in a local or regional scale, uh, I think here in Sweden and in, in our region, uh, a lot of uh, like uh, food production and this kind of um, local farming is something that is uh, really in high interest of that we can have seen that um, in interruption in uh, in streams of materials coming in so the circular economy from the industry is more kicking in on that to, to have more robust uh, value change uh, coming in so i think it's really affect us in different ways and um, and that we are changing our behavior as we go so um, yeah Thanks. Um, well, that's all we have time for right now. As I mentioned, we'll get back to, to more discussion with the audience, but thank you, Philip. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jessica and Philip. I think those final examples you gave of test beds is, is really important that the test bed approach can be everything from very technical solutions to, to testing how we could maybe live differently, change our lifestyles and so on and engage in different ways of uh, consumption and sharing and so on. So these are, these are really good examples to understand the, the breadth that's possible when we talk about test beds. We have one final speaker in this first part of the webinar. Um, it's Jennifer Lenhart, who's beaming in from Santiago in Chile. Um, Jennifer is the global lead at WWF Sustainable Cities. Um, I can see the sun is shining on her. I believe it, the sun's coming up there in Santiago, right, Jennifer? It is indeed. Yes, I'm watching the sunrise over the Andes. So apologize if it just got very bright. <laughs> you, you look fantastic. Um, <laughs> let's jump into it. I, I want to ask you a question here. I think that many of the people watching will have heard of WWF and WWF has traditionally worked with nature and biodiversity and so on. But now here you are as the global lead working with WWF Sustainable City. So why is WWF engaging with urban development? Fantastic question. And it's, it's always where we like to start because everyone kind of scratches their head a little bit. Why is an organization so famous for saving pandas or tigers or elephants now working in the city space. Now I first should retract and say we're definitely still very much a conservation organization. This remains our priority and we know the urgency. Uh, just a, a few weeks back we led out uh, this year's Living Planet Index which shows since 1970 a 68% decline uh, and, the, and the size of mammals, uh, amphibians, and kind of overall wildlife. So we, we see the urgency is, is ever more present to address the conservation challenges. But we cannot do that looking only at the savanna. We cannot do that looking only at the forest. We have to see where the people are, where the consumption is happening. Um, I think just kind of building on what both Philip and Kathy said, you know, cities are the places where consumption is happening. Cities are home to 55% of the population, and this number is growing. Cities are responsible for roughly 70% of carbon emissions. This number is sometimes growing, but hopefully we're also seeing some positive shifts away from that. Also responsible for roughly 75% of natural resource consumption. Um, so if we're really going to tackle the, you know, the, the challenges of our conservation issues and our climate issues, we also have to look at where we can make the most significant impact. Cities are also responsible for 80% of um, GDP. So of course, where, I mean, money is always an issue. It is always a challenge, but it is also where, where we have the resources to actually change and shift. Uh, I know there's been already some talk about circularity and circular thinking. I mean, cities are the places to do that, whether it's mixing and reusing energy resources, uh, cascading energy systems, reusing, uh, different products. I mean, I know you guys are so much more into the sharing economy and all the wonderful research behind it. So I don't want to speak to the experts, uh, but I mean, there's a lot of opportunities when we see cities. So I think this is for, 
for WWF kind of a, a new territory, a new frontier, a new mission, if you will, so that how can we support so many of the great cities that are out there showing inspiration? How can we gain inspiration from them? Umeå was our uh, One Planet City Challenge winner in Sweden a, a few years ago. We worked very closely with ECLE, C40, Global Covenant of Mayors. So I, mean, I think there's a lot of connection points here. No, absolutely. Um, I think you answered all my questions in one go. Now I'll try a few questions at you now, Jennifer. Um, so this term missions, you mentioned that now. I mean, when you hear yes. the term missions or missions approach, I mean, how do you relate to it? And, and, and what do you think about or what kind of gets you inspired by this, by this terminology or concept? Oh, gosh, because I was so excited to see that because I think it takes all of us out of our little bit of our mantra on the things that we commonly say at a lot of these conferences and allows us to think a little bit creatively. So I'm going to start with a personal story. Uh, from the time I could think until I was about 18, 19 years old, all I wanted to do was be an astronaut and I wanted to go to Mars. Uh, and I had a book. I mean, I wrote, I started practicing since I think I was 10 years old. What would be my quote? Yeah, you know, kind of Neil Armstrong's uh, quote of one step for man, one giant leap for mankind. What would be my quote when I was the first person, the first woman to land on Mars? Well, I spent a year living in uh, the beautiful island nation of Haiti, has lots of challenges, but also a wonderful, wonderful place. And, and I realized in that moment, there's so much to do on earth, so much to explore, so much to learn, so much to support and change uh, that, I mean, Mars should still be maybe what is something that we think about into the future. But first we have this beautiful planet that we have to protect and all of its fantastic people. Uh, so, so that's kind of where I came kind of thinking, you know, initially really from the spaceship angle. And then recently, of course, with COVID, we've been all been watching a little bit more Netflix than normal. And I've been watching some of these Mars mission stories. So kind of thinking back to my child mind and pulling into that creativity and stories. So I thought about what, what you said, you know, when it comes to missions, uh, it's about adventure. Uh, it's about calculated planning. I mean, if we're sending people way far away from earth, they have to have everything that they need. It's about circular thinking and sharing economy in a, a very real sense. So how can we learn? And I know NASA has actually been a little bit involved in some of these things when it comes to sustainable cities, because how can we think in a closed system, not pulling all of our resources from nature and throwing all our waste into the atmosphere or in, into the oceans, but really thinking circular. So to me, it was really, really an exciting question. Uh, and then maybe my final, Point there would be it's about a story a common story and I think this I heard a podcast about this recently and it kind of turned the light on like the sun is shining on my face now but you know we need a common story the threats are real the climate crisis is out of control biodiversity loss is almost even more threatening we need a common story of where we can go collectively as humanity each with our own individual contribution from our own city perspective, from our rural perspectives as well. We need them involved, uh, but we need to know where do we wanna go together? So I think that to me is what, uh, what triggered my thoughts when you said, what is our mission? Brilliant. Um, yeah, I didn't actually realize someone would refer to being an astronaut. That's a good one. Um, look, I think your point about a sense of adventure and about real inspiration um, and, a, and also a calculated measurement that this isn't, uh, this isn't a game. I mean, when they tried to go to the moon, they had to get them there and back alive. So, and the same is the case with climate change. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Look, I'm going to jump to this because I think in your work that you come into contact with many examples of cities around the world yeah. doing great things. And this is going to be a tough one, but I'm going to ask you to choose one of those cities that inspires you a bit or has given you a, or has provided an inspirational story about their way they're working with, with climate change or sustainable development. So can, can you pick one, Jennifer? Well, um, I usually call myself a cosmopolitan nomad. Uh, I've called more than 25 cities home in eight different countries um, on many different uh, continents. Uh, cities are my mentors uh, and my friends. I think uh, I would say Malmo, um, but not only, I'm going, to, I'm going to challenge a little bit your question. I'm gonna say Malmo, uh, Rotterdam, and Medellin. And these are three cities that have had struggle, uh, whether it's an economic collapse, social violence, um, uh, war-torn and having to rebuild, 
But these are cities that said, you know, rolled up their sleeves and said, how can we create a new story, a new vision of where we want to go? And we're not going to do that with one sector approach. We're going to do it holistically. We're going to bring people on board early on, uh, whether it's citizens or architects or different um, sectoral strategies. We're going to bring everyone to the table and think, how can we envision our city? So Malmö has become, you know, world famous now with its uh, Western Harbor, 100% renewable energy district, beautiful design, lots of green space. Uh, I created a new vision for that story, uh, for that city. Uh, Rotterdam, you know, was hugely impacted by World War II, uh, had a clean slate in many senses, but had to redefine how, how, how it designs itself. So it's, it's a constantly rethinking, it's become a world leader when it comes to climate adaptation and water management. It's also right on the coast and we know all the challenges of uh, the climate crisis when it comes to a city like Rotterdam and the city like, uh, like Medellin that was many years uh, plagued by challenges with, with, with violence, but also just uh, poverty as well but has brought everyone together from the mayor's office to local NGOs to think, how can we de redesign our city? And they put some of the most spectacular new buildings up in the poorest communities and they connected a gondola, uh, a teleferico to, to connect around to that city to say that these most beautiful places should be accessible to everyone in our city, not for the rich, not for the poor, but for everyone. I think it comes back to the people-centric approach that these three cities had. I could talk about Santiago where I'm living now, a city that is doing lots of transition as well, uh, improving on bike lanes, has a great COVID uh, uh, strategy in terms of rolling out much more spaces for people and less places for cars. Uh, but I cheated because I gave four cities now. Fantastic examples. I knew you couldn't choose one. Um, we're going to jump over to Jessica now, who's got a few questions coming in from around the world. Over to you, Jessica. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we've got questions. We've also got um, tips. We've got a tip for an inspirational movie, uh, Into Reflections, uh, from Peter Joseph that people should watch that uh, got suggested based on uh, Jennifer's speech about Mars and missions. <laughs> uh, but we do also have some questions. Um, so one of the questions, Jennifer, is also about WWF is, is a global organization, an international mm -hmm. organization that has access to many decision-making arenas. Mm -hmm. And the question is, are there still some arenas or decision-making places where, where WWF would like to be more involved or have better access to? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh gosh, I mean, definitely. Uh, we can always improve. I think any of us that would be speaking here would, uh, can always get further, further afield. I wanna point out last Monday, uh, WWF supported an event uh, called the Leaders Pledge for Nature. Uh, and we had, uh, I think, more than 30 heads of state speak uh, on their commitments for nature conservation, uh, conservation and climate. Uh, and to date, we've had more than 75 heads of state sign on to that commitment for, for uh, the Leaders Pledge for Nature. If you Google it, you'll find it. Um, it was WWF supported. Several uh, countries were in the lead as well as UN agencies, et cetera. So I think but that's really a place where we uh, can leverage this traction and, and moving between different levels. Uh, but I think uh, the question on how can we improve on this better? Uh, certainly, you know, uh, every time we, we want, we as a conservation organization, we as a climate uh, leadership organization, we're going to always try to push a little bit further. Um, so, you know, we would like to have even stronger targets. I know that the, the European Parliament just agreed yesterday, as it were, a relatively ambitious climate target. We would like it to be even further. So we're gonna keep pushing, we're gonna keep pushing. And of course, when we talk to private sector partners or, or city governments, we're going to push as well. Uh, but we have to be empathetic to where they are at the start. What can they actually do? Listening, listen, we talk a lot, but we need to listen. Where Meet people where they're at and then uh, help them get a little bit further. And maybe I can just add our motto at WWF is together possible. So we don't think that we can do this alone, most certainly not, but we can definitely do this in partnership as the other speakers have also said. Yes, and I think we'll be getting back to the to the actors and which actors we, we really need involved in these missions um, when we when we open it up. Um, we also have a question about the key motivational elements that could drive more cities towards being more responsible. What would you see as key motivational elements? Hmm. Uh, well, I think one of them for us uh, has been, you know, 
pushing a friendly competition among cities, you know, recognizing what cities that we call, you know, really inspirational leaders and, and putting them out in the forefront. Uh, and then as citizens and also as NGOs, how do we keep cities accountable uh, so that if they say they're doing something that we kind of, you know, we, we, we wave our hands and say, yes, remember to do this. Uh, you said you would do this. Uh, we have within WWF, our flagship cities program is called the One Planet City Challenge. Uh, and here we are working with cities um, to do their data reporting on a, uh, the ECLA CDP common data uh, reporting system. And we see this is really important that we have uh, a baseline data uh, that cities add all of their data there and it's comparable to a certain extent. So that that really helps us to see where cities are and also where they can go. Uh, for the last year and a half, we have also used that data to see how closely cities are aligned to the Paris Agreement and the 1.5 degree uh, Celsius target for global warming. Uh, we have a lot more work to do. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a huge mission, if you will, uh, but we definitely see that uh, cities are willing and uh, to move with us in that direction. So I think, yeah, access to data, learning, uh, and a friendly competition. Great. Thanks. Um, thank you, Jennifer. That's all we have time for from, from the, um, the Q&A, but I will remind people that it is in the Q&A in Zoom that you should ask your question, not through email or another form. We do see them here. Um, we are trying to answer them both here live and some of the questions we're also typing answers to. We will also have a session after the FICA break where we're talking to all of our speakers again, including Jennifer, um, and we'll ask some of the, some of the questions were quite general and, and good for all of you. So I've, I've kept some of them for, for the end as well. Thank you, Jennifer. And back to you, Kez. Fantastic work, uh, Jessica and Jennifer. Um, we've come to the end of part one for our uh, webinar. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty amazed by how fantastic online events can be when you can bring in speakers from Australia, Chile and, and Northern Sweden and, and hear points of view and, and ideas and experiences from all around the world. Um, we have now arrived at our Swedish FIGA break. Um, this is a very Swedish thing to do, take a break, take lots of them, but we're going to have about 10, 15 minutes uh, where you can go grab a coffee, stretch your legs, have a bit of a think about what you've heard um, and just enjoy a moment. Um, after the break, we will have two panellists who will be reflecting and, and answering and thinking about some of the questions that have been coming in from all around the world. We'll have the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Lund University and the National Architect of Sweden. So enjoy the break and see you again soon. How can we shape urban development towards sustainable and prosperous futures? My name is Kes McCormick and I'll be one of the professors answering this and many other questions in our course on greening the economy, sustainable cities. This course will explore sustainable cities as engines for greening the economy. We will place cities in the context of sustainable urban transformation and climate change. Sustainable urban transformation refers to structural transformation processes which involve multi-dimensional and radical change that can effectively direct urban development towards ambitious sustainability and climate goals. This course will explore nature-based solutions in cities in Europe and around the world. It will connect together the key themes of nature, cities and innovation. We will discuss how to assess what nature-based solutions can achieve in cities. We will examine how innovation is taking place in cities and we will analyse the potential of nature-based solutions to help respond to climate change and sustainability challenges. This course combines both technical knowledge and the social sciences to better understand nature-based solutions in a holistic perspective. New governance arrangements, business models, financing and forms of citizen engagement will be needed to make the promise of nature-based solutions a reality. In this course, we bring together a collection of diverse films
hello again. This is uh, Kes McCormick, and I hope you enjoyed your, your break. Um, you were just watching some films there from our massive open online courses. Uh, my technical team just said I should let everyone know those films were done when I used to have hair. So that has now changed slightly. Um, now we're back for part two of the webinar, um, and we're going to kick it off with another menti with Bjorn. So I'm going to see where Bjorn is on my screen and jump over to Bjorn, where he's going to ask you some more questions. Over to you, Bjorn. Hi, thank you very much, uh, Kes. It's nice being back. A short break. Um, and uh, I have uh, two questions this time. Uh, and uh, since I'm very fond of doing these word clouds together with the audience, that's what we're going to do. Um, now, again, it's time to open your uh, apps or uh, uh, using uh, other devices to, um, to find the Menti page. So please go uh, once again into menti.com and use the code uh, which you find on the upper right corner. And it's a new code, I just want to tell you. Um, make notice uh, that it's a new code we're using this time, 2479610. And those, uh, some people are always fast and they are now already starting answering questions. Um, the question we have for you is on transformation action. Now that we have heard so many uh, good points from, from uh, the three speakers, but we want to know uh, a bit about your view. So what processes or actions are key to sustainable urban transformations? And again, I want you to list one, two, three keywords to make this beautiful co-creative uh, word cloud. And we can see answers already popping in. And uh, for those of you who have just entered the scene after the break, after the FICA, we're in the Menti. We have a new code, uh, 2479610. And we're answering questions. And I can see that we have many people, but I think there are still some people making their way into the Mentimeter. And uh, as we speak, we can see this, this word, word cloud growing. We have at the center stage, and again, for, you, uh, for, for those of you who are not familiar with Menti before, but this word cloud is, is then showing or illustrating the most common words are the most big words. So we have innovation at the center at the moment, but together with collaboration, planning, participation as a keyword, um, much spoken of here earlier today in the webinar, the need to, uh, to, to, to have citizen, citizen involvement and uh, participatory governance modes. Planning, collaboration, participation, innovation, engagement, we can see there, and co-creation. That's a, a really uh, popular word these days, but I actually think it means something, uh, thinking about part participation. So collaborative efforts, that is what we want uh, and think of as important key actions. Uh, thank you very much. We will proceed now to the, to the next question. If I just find the bottom here, yes. And uh, so the second um, question I have in store for you is the following. Transformation replication, also something that we touched upon, the scalability and so forth. Uh, now, all the speakers got this uh, question but I want to ask you, listeners and participants here today, if you got the chance, what can you name a city in the world that inspires you when it comes to uh, sustainable urban transformation? And again, uh, making a, a word cloud here together. And of course, I don't want this to be perceived as any competition. Of course not. You might guess that I'm 
I'm out for the for the for the diversity here. Uh, and what do we see? Singapore, Amsterdam, Copenhagen. Rotterdam or Notre Dame, as someone is calling it in a, another research project. Vancouver, Barcelona, cities from all over the world. Copenhagen, not maybe surprisingly, a very good biking city. Amsterdam, Malmo. Well, thank you for sharing. Uh, there's so so many cities in the world that uh, that are inspiring, and 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 uh, I do want to make a point here. Uh, even though we're talking about scalability, but we also mentioned that the need to consider all cities at all levels, uh, not only the big shots, uh, uh, but also smaller towns all around the world, because it's all all these actions that that are needed. Uh, so. It's good not always to look at the big ones, but also look at the small ones. Um, people are still contributing. I will let, uh, you can still contribute af after this, but uh, now it's time to move on in the program. So I'm asking Kes, have you been in any of these cities? In fact, I've been in quite a few of them, Bjorn. It's, it's fascinating to see some of the places that are popping up. Singapore, absolutely an incredible kind of garden city. And of course, Copenhagen, famous for its cycling and so on. Amsterdam, also pretty famous for its cycling. And I see Barcelona appearing in there as well, which is an incredible city in terms of how they work with space, public spaces and so on. Yes. So I will leave it here and then... We'll get back one more final time uh, later on in the program. Thank you for contributing, folks. Fantastic, Bjorn. Absolutely, like you said, I mean, it's great to have these kind of uh, interactivity with people around the world, sending in kind of their ideas and, and sharing their thoughts and so on. We're now going to open up the conversation and reflect a bit on what we heard in part one of the webinar. Um, and we're going to invite in two other people uh, or there'll be four of us on screen. Sylvia Swag Saga is the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Lund University. Um, Lund University happens to be the largest university in Scandinavia. Um, and Sylvia has worked in a lot of different areas and I'm not going to attempt to, uh, to summarize them all, but I will say that she has worked with transformation processes in, in different, different aspects. And at the moment, I know that she's a lead person at Lund University working with the sustainable development goals and how we integrate that into a university, um, not just as an organization, but also into our teaching and learning. So Sylvia is here with us. We'll also have Helena Bjarnegård, who's the National Architect of Sweden. Um, as we kind of learned during the bake, we, I understand that she's the first national architect of Sweden. Um, fantastic to have you both here. Um, I'm going to pose a few questions to, to you, and Jessica will also bring some questions in from the global audience. But I mean, just firstly to, to Sylvia, I mean, I, I know that, that cities and urban development isn't your core area, so you come at perhaps with a broader perspective, which we're really keen to hear. But when you hear these speakers talk about these topics of mission, sustainability and innovation, is there a key point that really stands out to you, something that, that you want to kind of lift up again and say, yep, that is absolutely critical to, these, uh, to this area? Thanks, Kes. I hope you can hear me well. And uh, yes. thanks for inviting me. Um, I think it's been a really fascinating discussion so far. I've learned a ton. And as you said, Kes, I work m mainly with innovation policy at a national and a supranational level. Um, so in the European Commission and, and for many governments. Um, I think one of the th clear things that emerges for me from this discussion is how missions and cities are a really good fit. Um, and that I think is because as a lot of the previous speakers have pointed out, it has to do with a sense of urgency created a around a common understanding of what the problems are. Um, and I think uh, Jennifer mentioned, for example, the city of Malmö, which is where I also live. And I think that's a very good example of a city which has a very keen understanding of what its problems are. And that creates a sense of urgency, uh, which then uh, creates a, sort of a momentum, which is very conducive to emissions. Um, so that's my first point is that I think missions uh, are, and cities are a really good fit because they focus on common problems that one is very joined in an effort to address. I would also say that I think cities are an extremely and sometimes um, underrated driver of transformation. 
Um, right now, my concern is that uh, national governments are not powerful enough or, or, or ambitious enough in driving the transformation that we need to move to combining people, planet, and prosperity. Um, and here, I think cities are extremely important. Um, but if I could also move to, to maybe some of the challenges I hear, and I think, again, Jennifer raised a really good po a point about accountability. I worked 10 years for the Swedish Government Agency for Innovation, where we supported a lot of cities in their, in their missions and in their transformative ambitions. But we did see two problems. One was uh, accountability, pr precisely as was mentioned, but the other one was scalability. And I saw that also, for example, in Norway, when I looked at um, innovation at city level, that you know, tons of cities are doing really interesting things, um, but there is very little mechanism or incentive for sharing or scaling. And that ironically tends to be a bigger problem perhaps within countries then, um, and again, there's some like this, this, these initiatives of, of international city networks, I think are extremely useful in this context, but they don't necessarily solve the problem on a national level that if you're funding one city to do something really interesting, how do you make sure the other cities are going to implement that in your country. Um, so that would maybe be my my sort of first take on um, on what I've been hearing. Uh, I also am concerned that uh, you know, we're living in an era where the national level has risen in, in, in uh, prominence due to COVID, which I think is concerning because our problems will often be tackled at the municipal or at the supranational level. And maybe finally, just a, a, um, maybe a slightly provocative term, I think we should discuss a little bit more which problems can be uh, traced back or where, where cities are part of the problem you know, like segregation and which problems where cities are part of the solution. And these things are not mutually exclusive, exclusive uh, but I think it's good to have a clear understanding of, you know, where can we see certain problems originating at the city level and where can we clearly see solutions originating at the city level? I'll stop there, thanks. No, I mean, fantastic points. Um, I think absolutely this, this last point you're making about kind of understanding the problems and the structure of problems and understanding solutions and the structure of solutions and how those fit together. It's very important that we don't rush into things where we don't have a good plan about how we're going to follow it through and a good understanding of innovation systems and how they work. This is a very good follow up. I'm going to ask the same question to Helena. Um, as you listen to this discussion, uh, Helena, I mean, as the National Architect of Sweden, I mean, what do you take away from what the speakers are saying here about sustainable urban development? Oh, it's been such a good speak, so all three of them, and I take with me a lot of inspiration into my work. And one thing that I've been thinking about is combining short-term perspective and long-term perspective. I work, I've been working before with the city planning in quite a big city in Sweden, and right now I'm on a national level, and I'm working with uh, 11 agencies in the board for sustainable cities and um, we do things here and now today we're having a webinar tomorrow we're making a decision maybe we're doing an innovative technology a technique innovation of some kind in a few years uh, a city plan um, takes two three years to develop a block maybe 10 years. Uh, the houses that we build right now, they're supposed to stand there for at least 100 years. And the city structure that we make, how we you know, place the blocks, how many crossroads we have, if we have parks, if we have squares, how many homes, how, how tall is the building, everything. That's, that's structure, 1,000 years. And to combine uh, the short-term thinking with the long-term thinking and all the processes uh, for governance and so on. That's a very, very tricky part. But I think that the mission tool is a very good tool to, to work with. And I see that it's a re it really is a solution tool. And I like that a lot. Uh, should I stop there or should I continue? Maybe you want to... <laughs> I mean, it's, I know you can continue, but it's a, I think it's a good point. So, I mean, I think that the issue of time scale or time and space mm -hmm. um, when we
when we talk about complexity is definitely something we need need to work with um, in this in this kind of arena of cities and missions and sustainability. Um, I'm actually going to bring in Jessica here and see what kind of points are coming in from from our global audience because I, because I really do think we're getting in quite a few great questions. So Jessica, over to you. Is there something you want to raise with Elena and Sylvia? Yeah, I mean, I think I think both of you have also raised questions that maybe when we get back to um, all the panelists together um, and our and our speakers, because um, we are getting the same sorts of questions about what also COVID situation means and and what are the drivers that will ensure that we go forward. So we've been talking about some of the complexities here with time, space, um, but also with COVID as a in a way a crisis, but also an opportunity to ensure that we do make progress. And what, what can we do to ensure that the, that the drivers are in place that move us forward the way we want to go? And we talked about missions being a goal and what is that goal and how can we move from COVID towards that goal? Mm. Who do you want to play for? <laughs> um, I, mean, I think yeah. that we have, yeah, we had, we had big challenges in the world before COVID and we still have same challenges. And we also have COVID, of course. So uh, um, COVID, just, just put the finger on that, that we have those challenges. And also that it's important that we move on quickly. And uh, the thing that we learned within the COVID situation, it is that you know, we can work in new ways. We can make things happen. We can unite, we can do things together very, very fast if we really want to, and if we really feel this sense of urgency. And that is a reminder that it, it is possible to change the world faster than we, than we think, and, then, and what we thought before COVID. So somehow it's an opportunity. It's um, definitely do not like COVID, but it puts the, you know, the finger on that. It's an opportunity too. Mm. And shows what what is possible when we recognize yeah. mm. a crisis um, mm -hmm. and we respond to it. Um, Sylvia, also you mentioned about the um, about cities being an, an interesting um, arena for for missions, but also the interplay with the the national level. How do you see the national level being able to help and and drive with with cities sharing missions? Uh, thanks, Jessica. I one of the things I've been thinking about a lot during this talk is, uh, you know, the kind of transformation that I think we're increasingly all agreeing on that we're going to need to to be able to combine environmental, ecological, and um, social responsibility is going to require some fundamental disruption and transformation, and it's going to be about taking risks. And the question then becomes, where are where is this risk taking happening, and how is risk being shared? Um, and, and, and this, I think, is one of the things that we are not discussing enough. So we have the national level often encouraging cities to experiment or to do test beds, but that's not the same as risk sharing. I think experimentation needs to involve a commitment on a national level and a city level to actually, you know, an experiment sometimes become a substitute for action. Do you know what I mean? Like we're, we're trying something, but we actually have no intention of of implementing it, but it's a way to say that we're doing something. So I think we need a commitment to actually implement things that work and to find support for implementing things that work. But we also need to talk about risk sharing so that it just doesn't just stay with test beds. You know, test beds are not the same as risk sharing. Um, and I think that's something that is perhaps requires more discussion. Um, another thing that I think would be really interesting to talk about, I also saw there was a question about the role of universities is in these times of uncertainty, and COVID certainly is one of them, and I think Helena made a really good point about the different time frames, is that I think um, foresight and anticipatory, um, you know, policymaking becomes more important than ever. So paradoxically, in this time of uncertainty, trying to understand what's going to happen in the future is actually becoming more important, not less, because it's going to help us understand the future we want to shape. And so that is something that I think you can do very um, but national level among cities, but there and also where universities could play a role. The national level uh, works with different tools, you know, and um, uh, we work with um, you know financial tools. And the national level can really you know put finance as we heard viable cities before, and that's uh, uh, Vinova Formas, uh, the energy agency, the, the the state agencies in Sweden putting money into a program that. Uh, that's supposed to support the cities financially 
and also with knowledge. So that's one thing that the, the national level can do to support financially and with knowledge. And also uh, after we've tried those test beds, for example, in viable cities, we need to look at the, the laws, um, the planning and building law, is that supporting this way of thinking or is it not? Probably not. Can we change it in some way so it will be easier, faster to transform the, um, the way we build and plan and develop the cities? So that's some things uh, that the national level can do and the national level can also unite. I think it's very important that someone has the, the power and also just the inviting power to say, okay, let's talk to each other, let's work together, um, put the cities in the same room and say, we're supposed to work together. What can you do? What can we do? What can you learn from each other? So connecting cities and make uh, cities learn from each other and so on. That's, that's a big thing to do too, actually. Yeah. These Lynn. are great points. I'm going to jump in here because I feel like I've got to jump in. Um, fantastic. Look, I think a really interesting point, Sylvia, that you raised there about uh, anticipating the future or trying to understand the future. To be a bit provocative, I once heard a speaker say, don't try to understand the future, instead try to design the future, which you know is getting to the point of that we are kind of in control of our futures in some way. And I know that you were thinking that as well, but it is an interesting point that don't spend too much time trying to think what might happen, work out what you want to happen and try to create that to happen, of course. But you also made another really good point, Sylvia, about kind of, I think, in a way, elephants in the room, or what are we missing, like risk sharing and so on. And I want to just get back to that if I can to both of you. I mean, is there something that we're not talking about in this discussion today that you feel really deserves to be lift up, lifted up, or is perhaps an elephant in the room, like the risk sharing and so on? Like, Sylvia, could you follow on on that a bit? Like things that you think we really, we need to tackle some other issues which we're not talking yeah. about? Yeah, so, so one of the things, that's a really good question, because I think one of the things that concerns me in, in innovation policy discussions is that, you know, we talk a lot about stakeholder inclusion, and I think that is absolutely important. But I have seen a few too many processes of innovation partnerships or innovation programs, where which sort of are reduced to gathering people around a table and thinking something transformative is going to happen when actually it's just going to lead to a low, lowest common denominator. So I think, you know, how, how do we address resistance to change? How do we address, how do we plan for disruption? Um, you know, how do we design that knowing that we need to anticipate that there will be, you know, groups or actors that are not going to be happy with the change that's being proposed. So I think that's something, particularly in the Nordic countries, and I'm not myself from the Nordic countries, but the Nordic countries, which are excellent, um, which have a very high level of trust in decision making and also in the public, um, and a very consensual decision making model. I think we need to bring that into the model. It's not at all in conflict with the model, but we don't talk about it enough. Yep, really good point. Helena, I want to throw that question to you as well. Is there an elephant in the room that we need to tackle? Yeah, actually, uh, as I'm the chair of the um, board for sustainable cities, I've been talking to cities, I've been talking to the private sector uh, those last few week, weeks, actually, and all of them raised the same question. And that's kind of an elephant in a room. And the question is the short term economic perspective that when we, uh, we, we say rethink, we need to rethink in, uh, and on a policy level, we are rethinking. But when, when it comes to the, the projects that we're going to invest in today, uh, it, comes down, it comes down to uh, that we are stuck in this short term term economic perspective and it's very very hard because the taxes the regulations and everything points in that direction and not it's the taxes the regulations all the other you know steering systems um they're making us getting stuck there and they're not putting us in the long-term economical perspective and and that we are able to take those decisions and that's about just that's just what Sylvia was talking about actually but in in other words um, how can we do that change together because we really really need to to not just to rethink 
we need to redo here and now? Oh, it's a, look, it's a really good point. I mean, they, these are obviously overwhelming challenges which we face. But as you kind of pointed out by, uh, about the pandemic and so on, it does create certain types of opportunities. And, and hopefully there is those kind of investments. And I think we talk about like the Green New Deal and things like that. These are attempts to try to create long-term certainty or long-term direction. So we kind of navigate towards something and that we help organisations and sectors make those kind of investments and decisions, which are kind of in a longer term space. But we still find it very difficult when we get down, like you're talking about, to the organisations and the businesses and the city municipalities to move beyond short-term thinking or short-term economics is very, very challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who's going to invest? Who's going to take the risk, and who will get uh, the long-term no good uh, view of it? Mm. Well, the good news is we're coming up with plenty of new questions for new online events. Uh, the, the bad <laughs> news is it's hard to find an easy answer to all these questions we're asking. We are actually going to jump over to Bjorn again and do some menti, and then we're going to bring everybody back, and Jessica is going to take the lead with some further questions from the global audience and so on. So, Bjorn, one more time, your last chance to run menti with a global audience. Over to you. Thank you so much, Jess. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of questions thrown up in the air, uh, and here I come asking more questions. But I have two questions, and uh, as you may have learned by, by this time, um, you have to go into menti.com or uh, you open your app and please type in the, the seven digit code on the upper right corner, um, which is 7625575. And uh, the question I have for you this time refers to the outputs uh, of, of this day, of this webinar. So what, what are your, your main interest in getting out uh, uh, from the day? What outputs of the summit are most useful to you? And um, you have different choices there. Um, you can um, choose between uh, film recordings from the webinar, um, the, a podcast episode, um, produced uh, uh, by colleagues here at the IIIE or a new MOOC on missions. MOOC is uh, relating to massive online open courses that we run here. Uh, or you wish to see an agenda with key actions, uh, some of the key actions we have been discussing here to get today. Or are you looking for inspiration and new ideas as an output? Um, and uh, well, we can see that people are throwing in their answers. And um, I don't want to say we have a winner because uh, you are all winners in this game because uh, the main point I want to make here is that you can all expect to, uh, uh, to, um, to get all of these uh, outputs. Uh, so I'm making some advertisement here for uh, what you can expect after this day. So uh, through, through our our uh, webpage for this summit, you will be able to find all these uh, outputs or information about them. Yes, thank you for, uh, for that. And now over to, um, to my last question here to you today. Uh, in terms of key outputs again, and relating to what we have been discussing, what are the top priority topics or discussion at the summit for you? And I want you to grade the topics here and, and please take your moment here to, to, to think about the, the following alternatives and, and grading, grading them between less important to very important in your perspective. So our top priority uh, topics relating to developing global alliances around urban missions, or is it engaging a diver diversity of organization or groups in the design and implementation of urban missions? Or is it about focus on urban missions in practice and how to overcome challenges and grab the opportunities? Or do you think that it's uh, top prioritized to enhance skills and knowledge for undertaking urban missions 
or your last option here? Is it about transforming cities through exponential roadmaps on urban missions? And you, as you are casting your votes and uh, on that scale, uh, I'm sitting here and thinking I am probably going to be very Swedish here uh, and doing uh, the Swedish diplomat style and say that uh, uh, we have no winners here, uh, of course. Uh, it's about, um, it's difficult to prioritize, but we need to, again, uh, grasp this this complexity and we need to do everything at all levels and not reduce it to a singular question. Uh, and um, well, but we, um, we can see that a lot of uh, the most votes or the, the, the highest graded here is uh, the question of focusing on urban missions in practice and how to overcome challenges in grabbing opportunities, maybe referring back to to what we heard from Helena about, uh, it's not about talking, it's about doing. And um, I think that will be um, our take home from, from uh, this last Menti session. And again, uh, thank you very much for contributing. And uh, with this, I would like to go over to Cass. Fantastic, Bjorn. Um, again, it's, it is fascinating to see the answers coming in um, from around the world, from people listening and so on, what they what they see as the most important points and so on. Um, it's great to hear that people find this or are looking for inspiration and so on. I think it's, it's the first step to action to be inspired. We're going to welcome everyone to the stage now, um, our three uh, speakers and our panellists, as well as myself and Jessica. And I'm actually going to throw over to Jessica almost immediately because I think we've had so many questions coming in from people around the world. I think it's best that we get some of their questions to, to the people today, Jessica. So over to you, Jessica. Ask away. Thanks, Kes. Yes, yes. We've actually had some questions um, since the beginning that I've, I've held on to for this uh, final session because I think it's, it's some of these questions everyone can weigh in on. So one of the questions that was asked is, how new, we talked about missions being new, how new is it really? Um, is, it, is it repackaging old ideas or it, what is the new aspect to it and how does it differ from other holistic approaches towards urban transformation and sustainable urban transformation? Um, since, uh, since we haven't heard from Kathy since the beginning, Kathy, do you want to start with your answer? What's new about missions? Because I think you were the one that said missions are relatively new. Um, do you want to pinpoint what what about it is the newest element? It's, uh, I mean, maybe it's about trying to inspire so many actors to work together at the one time. I mean, I think it's it's right that there are a lot of um, a lot of initiatives that have you know that have been looking at inspiration, whether it's been urban living labs or you know test beds, as we've heard, or um, you know cities working together with other levels. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of initiatives, but I think that what we've heard and what I've what I've heard from our speakers and what I've read, you know, missions are about inspiration. It's about going for something really big together, and it's about working horizontally and and vertically. And and um, you know, I think. It's um, certainly, you know, it's, it's a new approach from my side of the world, I think, you know, I think that, the, you know, finding a, a framework that is not necessarily uniform for every single city, but the approach needs to be common. So I think that's the part that is new to me. So the common approach. Philip, do you have anything that you want to add about what's new about mission approach? Yeah, yeah for me, my reflection on that is that, um... Uh, before maybe we have targeted it as we have the solution and can implement it in the in a scale that works like uh, implementing um, uh, waste management systems etc so we can do it from one organization and, and like giving that to the to the public or, or the, the city function but here we are kind of this uh, dilemma that we have not the power in ourselves the organization we have to give away a bit of control and try to get other ones involved in the mission of, of this uh, climate neutral goals or, or a sustainable social city. Uh, and that's really 
that kind of unite them, uh, others to participate. So I think that is for me the new thing that we are kind of this, we are putting up this vision and, and the, the golden story, and then we are give, giving it to the other one to contribute with their own ideas and input. And we don't really know the road to that, uh, to the end that will be a new beginning, I would say. So yeah, that is new for me anyway, that uh, we are kind of bringing more actors and stakeholders and citizens in the, in the early phase when we are kind of developing the mission. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, is there anything for you that's new about the mission approach than other holistic approaches or inclusive approaches from before? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think I will go back to the kind of Mars mission approach. It's an all hands on deck. I mean, everybody has a part to play. If you think of the mission control room, when there's a crisis that happens and we are very much in a climate and a biodiversity crisis, everyone has a part to play. Uh, whether it's the mayor, whether it's the researcher, whether it's the citizen on the street, uh, it's connecting those ideas. I think until now we've done a lot of pilots, we've seen incremental changes and those have been very good and very inspirational to show us a, a path of where we need to go, but we really need to all connect. And I just wanna plug also, um, we talked a little about exponential change. Um, and at WWF, we've also been part of the exponential roadmap, uh, which brings together various organizations like Future Earth, Stockholm Resilience Center, and, and several others to looking at really how can we uh, exponentially move to where we need to go. We need to half our emissions by 2030, and then we need to half them again, and we need to get to net zero emissions by 2050. This is a huge challenge that we have never done in human history, but it is fully within our reach. And these, these test beds, these, uh, these shifts have showed us, you know, the pathway. Now we just need to shine the light, like the lights coming in on my window from the sun uh, and just really go forward with full momentum. Great, thanks. Sylvia, did you have anything that you wanted to weigh in on about missions and the novelty factor? Um, yeah, no, they're not new in a way. I think the new thing about missions is is what one of the things, that, the aha moments for me from this uh, discussion, for example, is how well I said, like I said, I think they fit with urban development and with cities. Um, they've more been applied in a national context. Obviously, that's the big difference. And then also they've been applied very much focusing on developing a technology or as somebody said, putting a man on the moon. So they haven't really been applied as much to this kind of holistic development agenda that we're now all striving for, which is combining different aspects of sustain sustainability. That I think is relatively new to the missions. Also it's focus in, in, in at the city level, but otherwise they're not new. And, and um, I would disagree with everybody. They're a really um, powerful instrument when implemented wisely. Okay, so maybe not new, but maybe new for cities. Um, you know, what do you think, Helena? Oh, the other way around. <laughs> I think this is, uh, this is the way architects have been working for 2000 years um, to put uh, Vitruvius, who was the architect of Rome 2000 years ago, he said that uh, uh, every city should be functionally, um, should have all those functions, that it should work for people, uh, it shall be, should be sustainable and robust in, in every way, and it should be beautiful and good for people, and we should could be able to, to make all those uh, choice, the choices that we want to make in our lives. So, so this is really an old, um, you know, way of work, an old way of work and uh, working as an, as an architect. But the new thing is it's, it's much wider. It connects the innovation um, part with the city planning. Uh, part and make it as a whole and with and the holistic view is is much more holistic than we've ever been seen, seen before so it's much wider and includes much more so and we're all talking talking the same language and just that is a good thing mm -hmm. so i think we we hear a lot about maybe the new is actors being involved in this inclusion factor to it as well. And maybe maybe the fact that it's at cities is, is a rejuvenation of what cities have been doing in the past. Um, yeah, this uh, was, was one of the questions. Another question um, that we had from the audience also was about this inclusiveness and how do we get those actors and sometimes it can be the citizens themselves who are not um, 
involved or or as excited about the mission. Um, so how do we get that? We talked about buy-in um, and, and that you need buy-in from, from the participants and from the citizens. Um, any ideas on how you get that buy-in and, and what you do when, when it is the citizens themselves who might be those that are not buying in from the beginning? Um, do we have a panelist that wants to take this question first? Uh, Kathy, then Jennifer. Kathy. I was actually going to refer to Jennifer in my response um, <laughs> in that, well, in that, you know, uh, this is all about inspiration and it's about, um, you know, con conveying the narrative that this is possible, it's technically feasible, it is actually attainable whilst it is complex and it's in that complexity that we need our political leaders in our in the cities and going to, I think, you know, Sylvia, I think was really right in talking about risk. We need our cities and our city leaders to know that taking risks is okay. And we need the, you know, all levels of government and citizens to allow that to occur as well. But, you know, back to, you know, how do we make it a reality? It's, it is about that inspiration. And, and, you know, whilst it might've been in, in Jess Kess talking to Jennifer about WWF and its role in cities, it's absolutely critical that we have, you know, organizations like WWF and the work that they're doing and inspiring citizens and cities to do better and, and providing a really robust methodology to do it. Um, you know, I think that that's, that's really key. So it's, you know, political leadership, but it's also leadership in all, from all actors, from, you know, the private sector to their NGOs um, and, 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 and that leadership and inspiration will you know, I, I believe it's really talking to what citizens are after anyway, you know, and if there's anything from a COVID, we keep saying the thing about COVID and the way that cities have been responding, we can see that change is possible. But what is a bit, a bit concerning to me right now, what I'm seeing is that yes, we've seen changes possible, but we, and to Helena's point, I feel like we're, we're starting to creep back into business as usual. Um, but the one thing that keeps me in that positive frame is that because of the work that cities have done, in understanding climate action and climate responses and having the information ready. Um, you know, I feel like there have been some really fabulous decisions that cities have made in response to COVID because they've been ready, because they've been committed to action around climate change. Thanks, Kathy. Anything to add, Jennifer? Yes. So uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, some of our work on climate, we started to think, how can we make this meaningful for, for new audiences? And we thought, okay, let's, let's bring in a health angle. Uh, and let's also talk about the youth and our children. Uh, so we started a, a big campaign looking at uh, air pollution in cities. Uh, and a lot of the air pollution in cities is also contributing to climate change. And what we, were, we learned uh, is that 90% of cities globally suffer from air pollution. And children are, suffer even greater because they breathe faster. So they take in more pollutants. Uh, and babies even uh, twice as much as that. So how can we connect people who might not think that climate change is so important, but to care deeply about their children or their nieces or their nephews or their grandchildren? And how can we really connect the dots when we talk about healthy lifestyles? We have to talk about the benefits of these, uh, these changes that we want to make. It can't just be about sacrifice, but it can be about cleaner and greener cities, cities for people, cities with less congestion, safer cities. So I think these sort of messages can bring new people on board and we have to relate where they are. So where are they living in the city? If we start talking about the polar ice caps, but they're not sure if they can you know, feed their children or pay for the electricity, I, we, that's not the message that we need to come to. So we need to really connect uh, at the human level, and sometimes that's individuals, that's sometimes working with neighborhoods and finding out what's most important at that level. And sometimes it's scaling, especially organizations like mine, that can connect the dots from, from you know, the individual all the way up to the, the national decision makers. That is a fantastic point, I think, to wrap up our City Futures Summit. Um, I'm gonna take charge again. Fantastic questions, Jessica. Thank you so much for pulling in these questions from a global audience. Look, I just want to say a huge thanks to, to all our speakers and panelists today. Um, for me, I just think it's, it's just wonderful inputs from different perspectives um, and different people from around the world. Um, thanks to all the co-hosts, to Jessica and Bjorn, great work. Thanks to our technical support team, uh, Peter and Lotta lurking in the background. You don't see them, but this certainly wouldn't be possible without them. Um, for me, 
if this event was supposed to inspire you, I've definitely been inspired. And I hope that everyone out there listening has, has learned something new, got a bit of inspiration, um, has got a bit of a bit of a skip in their step when they when they finish this webinar. Um, after the webinar, in about 30 minutes, um, there will be interactive workshops called collabs or collaborative laboratories. Um, this is a fantastic opportunity to meet some of the other people that have been listening to, to, to the webinar and to discuss what's important to you and what's important to them. So I encourage you to take the opportunity um, to join one of these collabs. All the information has been sent to you via email and you'll also get a slide up when this webinar is finished with the, how to join the collabs. Um, as Bjorn mentioned in his last Menti, there's a few outputs coming from the summit. Um, as we said, a, an agenda, a call for action, which summarizes some of the, the key points from this summit and some of the things that we think are really important to take forwards. We'll share that with everyone. We'll also develop a podcast from this summit, uh, interviewing some more people again um, and developing kind of a, a synthesis of what's come out of this online event. Um, so that's it from me and the team here at the, the City Futures Summit. Thank you for joining us. We really value your time. It's amazing to have a global audience at such an event. Enjoy the, the collabs. Have a great day. Thanks a lot.